We've got about 20 minutes till five o'clock, and that starts to become quite a tough slot. Um, so what I've gone with for a presentation today is basically a fast-hitting 20 QA best practices to take back to your workplace, something I can kind of leave you with. Uh, there's a few words, unfortunately, in the introduction and the first slide, but after that it's all images. And that's really what I'm going for, because for me, after five o'clock, the last thing I want to do is read a lot of words on a slide. So let's kick into it. So a very brief overview, uh, a bit of an introduction for those that don't know me. Our transformation to date from, I guess, when I started as the QA practice lead for lotteries and keno at Tabcorp till today, um, as well as those 20 QA best practices, and finally, some questions. So a little bit about me, I love software testing, that's pretty obvious, um, automation as well as software engineering. Um, the Testing Talks website, for example, was developed from scratch and, and I really enjoy engineering on the side. I'm really into finance and investing. Some people in this room have actually approached me and said that they used to come to a little club I used to run called FinShare, where we would actually share, I guess, knowledge and, and little tips and tricks about the stock market as well as the property market. And I love my sport, play a little bit of basketball when I can. Career experience, I actually started as a software engineer, so I worked in iOS and uh, actually discovered, I guess, a love of testing from being an engineer. It was then I actually worked with an engineering squad that didn't have testers, and as much as they'd claim in a forum like this that we do testing without testers, it was very evident to me that they were doing very poor testing without testers. And that was actually what gave me the inspiration to get into testing. I felt like there was a massive opportunity there that they could have been doing a lot of things better, that indeed there was a reason to have testers. So that's really where I'm coming from. That's why you get that passionate mindset when I talk. Um, as far as fun, I'm just like everyone else probably in this room. I like hanging out with family, great discussions with a few drinks, hence the open bar afterwards, and trying new things or starting new ventures, as well as a bit of gym, and I like going for very long walks. So I've been at Tabcorp now for, well, coming up. You can see there I've, I've been there since January 8th, 2017. And it was really interesting because when I joined Tabcorp uh, in the digital Melbourne space, which was the space back then, they never had QA as a practice. They never really thought of QA as like its own sort of practice that needs its own leadership and, and needs its own processes um, around the entire team. So I walked into pretty much, as you can imagine, not, not much at all. I, I kind of had just myself as a QA lead, and, and, and Tabcorp kind of considered me a manager, which we'll talk about. I kind of tried to change that culture as we went along. Uh, we had two manual testers, and we had something really crazy that some of the Tabcorp people will remember called the Wagering Flexi Resources. It's long gone now, but it was actually a, a spin-up team of, of wagering testers that we'd spit at different projects during regression periods and hope for the best because we'd have 15 or 20 people hit a project. I walked into that and, and needless to say, I, I could tell there were some issues there. Um, we had six projects in our wider portfolio as part of Digital Melbourne, one of which is Kino, which I'm sure you've heard a bit about today. Uh, we had two QAs, as you can see, and they were embedded in sprints. So that was one positive. They were working embedded in their teams. They were attending sprint plannings, going to retro, and those sorts of things. As you can see, we had minimal unit testing. So our developers had no real culture of unit testing. They didn't actually add unit tests as they developed in the, in the majority of projects. It wasn't even discussed, and there was no leadership coming down to say, this is something we need to do as part of the way we work. We had 16 automation tests across all those projects and they were basically a bit of fun. They were an experiment by a developer that had long left the company. Um, so those 16 automation tests, needless to say, were not giving us any value at all, but they did exist, so I wanted to pay credit to that. We had one mock server on one project, um, and it was Kino. However, it wasn't being used for testing, so it was actually developed to help us a little bit with our jackpot verification in Kino, but it had never been expanded beyond that. Bugs discovered, you know, I'm not the kind of person that will say we have to document every bug discovered, but not only were we not documenting our urgent defects at times, we were definitely weren't documenting defects discovered by automation, and that's something we've really changed. Automation coverage, as you can imagine, measured, but uh, was not measured rather, and, and <laughs> minimal. We had about 100 tests executed daily in CI, which was basically those 16 tests running in Keynote. Um, they hadn't been updated in over a year. 
Manual testing effort saved. I mean, we estimate about 20 minutes a day based on that CLI pipeline running those 16 tests and a few of the unit tests that were minimal that existed. And finally, no real automation executing correctly in CI. So it wasn't running on pull requests and it wasn't going for all those checks and balances like Ben Cooney just discussed. So as you can see, we started pretty much with a blank slate. That kind of got me amped up. That was what actually got me excited about the role. You know, while a lot of people would look at that and be a bit scared or a bit frightened of what they're walking into, for me, it was kind of like, okay, great. We've got something we can start from scratch. We can kick lots of goals, build up the momentum, and really drive this home. Because right now, we've got nothing. So even the littlest thing's going to seem like something. So let's just achieve, achieve, achieve. And that's kind of where we've got to today with these sorts of statistics. So. You know, now we've got 18 quality assurance experts, but more importantly, we're at an average of one QA for every four developers. So we like that ratio. We think that's about right. We have 16 projects now across the wider lotteries in Kino, and my role personally at Tabcorp has expanded from, I guess, the head of digital Melbourne to now the lead of lotteries in Kino in the newly merged Tabcorp, combining, as you heard from Aswin, and probably at our booths, the lotteries in Kino business unit, as well as wagering and gaming. All QAs still embedded in sprints, so I actually personally asked not to have any QAs reporting directly into me. I wanted to be the practice lead, but I felt like the QA should actually report into the team leads, and, and I should operate around the practice, uh, working on those improvements with the team. And that's a key point, is that I didn't want people to see me as the lead of QAs. I wanted them to see me as someone trying to improve QA with the wider team, be it testers, developers, BAs, product managers. That was how I wanted my role to be seen by the wider team. As you can see, we got the developers on board, and fortunately, a lot of the newer developers that have joined in the last couple of years have been on board from the start. So we've got tens of thousands of unit tests now, and that's really just a part of the way we work. There is a few projects still that are quite not there, but even they've come leaps and bounds. Um, We've got over 3,000 E2E automation tests now, actually, across those 16 projects. And I'm going to detail a little bit about how we come up with such a big number, because some of you might be thinking, wow, 3,000 E2E automation tests, that sounds like a lot, Cam. You must have over 1,000 tests in some of your projects. What's going on? Do they take hours to run or a day? So I'm going to detail that, because I don't want anyone thinking those kind of thoughts. And then uh, we've got seven mock servers now, uh, basically across 12 of our 16 projects. And I, I do detail that in a slide coming up, and the, and the real value of mocking over stubbing, as well as the value of mocks across platform. We do have 750 documented defects discovered, so that's not the types of bugs you're going to find in Sprint. Rather, we're, we're kind of carrying our automation bugs forward now, so anything that we find that's an urgent automation discovered bug, we're starting to document. And the reason we're doing that, it sounds a bit old school, but we love being able to say, you know what, we're investing this money in automation, look at the amazing bugs it's discovering keep funding what we're trying to do as a wider QA practice at Tabcorp. So that's why we do it. The majority of projects now are trending towards 80-90% coverage. And the people that work within our business unit can attest to that. That, that is the co coverage level we're heading towards. Um, the core level, as you can imagine, for those working in core systems, JET, those coverage levels are a lot harder to attain. It's just natural. No one really attains 80-90% coverage levels in core systems. Over 20,000 automation tests across the test pyramid are actually executed daily, and that's based on an estimate given from our BuildKite CI, which is totally consistent now across all those projects. Estimates are, and it's a big number, but generally speaking, it is accurate if you estimate around, you know, sort of a two and a half minute, three minute manual test per test, around that 900 hours saved daily. And we really push that number up to business to further show the kind of time we're saving by using automation. We're measuring and trending down with our TRC. We no longer have the wagering flexi resources, and the majority of our projects can go live within a day or two now. Um, there's some projects in the wagering side that are obviously not able to do such a thing, and they're more legacy systems. So when you think of lotteries and Kino, keep in mind we are, generally speaking, much more modern in that part of the business unit, and that's why we can have those sorts of things, you know, continuous releases and such. However, just keep in mind, if someone ever is working at Tabcorp and says we're trying to get to continuous releases, it's not really possible. You know, just they're just trying to sound good because we work in such a regulated environment that even if we had the most incredible testing in the world, we still get stopped by the regulator to go through a lot of regulatory hurdles before we get into production, and that's totally expected with a gambling application. 
And finally, automation executing in CI. The majority of projects are executing correctly in CI. The only project across that broader business unit um, is actually in a part of the old business unit, which is the EBT, which uh, Devinder in the audience can attest to. We haven't quite got the automation running on that in, an, in a CI build pipeline yet. We do have it actually deploying an artifact now, which is pretty incredible, because on the last slide, it took about two weeks for a developer to build the EBT. The EBT is the old, well, I won't say old, incredibly, Incredibly good machine, but it, it, it is 20 years old from a development perspective. So there's a bit of legacy code there, but you'll see that machine in our retail outlets when you go and place a bet. So I guess when I, when I was thinking about my presentation, I, I really wanted to kind of focus on the little things, but ultimately the little things that really garnered the massive change and the transformation that we achieved. Um, a lot of the conferences I've spoke at recently, I've been focusing on the big ticket items, you know, our common framework or our approach to mock servers or how we've driven visibility at Tabcorp. And I really like those topics, but today I want to do the things that were kind of under the hood that ultimately led to these successes. So that's what this presentation's about. So from a QA improvement perspective, I guess one of the first things we did, it sounds so simple, was we defined what QA meant to us as a team. So we basically got as many people as we could, developers, testers, BAs, product, and we basically said, what is QA? And it was quite incredible, like, the amount of different sort of uh, perspectives people had of what quality assurance really meant and how it worked. As you can see, um, you know, there was a lot of meetings, and there was a lot of big meetings as well. Uh, we actually had about 60 in the Melbourne meeting. And really, to simplify what we came out with, beyond all the sort of initiatives and things like that could, that could actually achieve what we wanted, you know, we, we realised that testing's owned by the whole team. And that, that was the reason why we held that meeting. It was to literally say, hey, testers don't own the testing. The wider team owns the testing, and the testers complement that. Um, and because of that, the testers are no longer to blame. Because in those early days, there was this culture in the company that if there was a bug in production, it must be the tester's fault. I always remember one of the first conversations I had with the team lead at Tabcorp, and there's still a few of them around today, where they'll say, Cam, I really want to have a KPI on the testers around bugs found in production. And it sickens me. <laughs> so every time this happens, I have to have a discussion with the team lead that's always incredibly passionate on both sides. And we usually come out with a formidable agreement by the end of it. <laughs> so the other thing which was key was we, we committed to this idea that we work 80% of our time as embedded QAs. We pick up cards, we test, we do automation. We threw away that title as well. We, didn't, we no longer refer to ourselves as automation engineers or, or manual testers. We hated that. We hated that separation, like different roles for different testers. We're all QAs now. And there's an expectation that we can do a mixture of manual exploratory testing and automation. But we support it by training, and that's key. You can't just go to everyone in the team, you know what, everyone does automation now, no. You have to cater to each other's skills and talents and introduce training and do different sessions. We're doing sessions now with Josh Adams, who's in the audience, he's from the core team. You know, he hasn't worked in digital applications like Angular, yet the other day, him and Tim Dewhurst are now starting to push test to Kino Web in a digital application, because they come to two hours of fortnightly training a week. That's the sort of stuff we try and introduce at Tabcorp, especially in the lotteries and Kino side, to bring everyone on the journey with us. And that, that really is a part of that 20% time as well. But it was also about enforcing that, because when you tell a delivery lead that you want to devote 20% of your time to QA practice improvements, that's a conversation in itself, because they think product, 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 and they don't understand always the value from the testing. So that's a big message you have to convey. Create and refresh your definition of done. Most people have a definition of done. They have an idea of what it is. Many of us have it in a Confluence page. But what I've seen is that often once it gets in that Confluence page, people tend to forget about it. People will help you implement it. You know, you can follow it up. You can get the basics right. But when we changed it to creating a definition of done, to refreshing a definition of done, we definitely noticed an improvement across a, a lot of our projects. So every three to six months, we come together. It also benefits new team members as well. And we basically talk about what are the quality assurance measures that we need to basically accomplish 
from conception to deployment of a card. And you'll see some of the classics there. You know, you'll see your bug bashes uh, from an exploratory testing perspective. You'll see business verification where after you've done your testing, you get the BAs and the, the product managers actually involved in the testing as well. Uh, you'll see your automation as well as your handovers and kickoffs. And that definition of done is a key piece of the puzzle to how we work. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect by any means. We still have projects that will put it on the wall but still not actually follow it, or some people just simply won't agree with it. So it's constant, right? You have to keep refreshing. You have to keep having that discussion. And ultimately, it's that discussion and refreshing it every three months that I've found actually makes it work. It's not having it on a piece of paper. It's having that constant discussion about what is our definition of done and what quality measures do we need to achieve to get it into deployment. This is actually a new thing that we've introduced in the last three or four months. If you'd asked me a year ago if I, be I believed in a sort of QA practice roadmap as such, I would have said, no, nah, I don't know, because I'd never really thought of it before. It sounded like more of something a product manager would have, you know, or a delivery manager and all the different features they're trying to get done over the next six months. But I had a manager that suggested it. And I actually, at first I was like, no, no, that's crazy. We don't work like that. But I gave it a go, right? Just to give it a go and see what we can get out of it. Best case. And it's actually been incredible. So we, we have documented now 36 QA practice initiatives in this exact format. So it spans about five or six pages. We keep it up to date. And it was interesting. So we basically started to open up more buy-in from the business. So at this point, we were doing a few other visibility measures, which I'll detail soon. But interestingly, by putting it in this format and showing people the constant achievements across every single initiative, it almost generated more momentum with the business. And they started to see these key initiatives that we talk about in our newsletters and our QA reports actually happening and progressing every single month. Now you can see a few of our key ones there. So we've got the Common Framework 2.0 initiative, which is all about bringing our Common Framework approach across lotteries in Brisbane. And that's that's firing on all cylinders. We're both on the same framework now, and I'll talk to that a little bit soon. You know, our mock server expansion, we love that approach. We're expanding it. The team love it up in Brisbane. Docker, you know, getting Docker across our web applications. We've got it in quite a few of them in Melbourne. Just leverage what we've done there, bring it up to Brisbane. As well as our exploratory testing, like mob testing and bug bashing sessions that we've found to be really beneficial for all our projects. Just bringing anyone that wants to come along and just bashing the hell out of the app based on a few of the features you've delivered in the sprint, finding those bugs that the automation might not pick up. And then uplifting core systems automation as well. You know, actually documenting that helped us a lot to say, you know what? This system is 15 years old, and this automation definitely was never added as part of Sprint when the system was created. We need to go back and add it now. Documenting it really empowered it. Test strategy. Another very tricky one. We're constantly trying to improve the way we do test strategy at Tabcorp. We started with it, keeping it simple. So we basically said, across our projects, what do we want to have on a sort of consistent approach for each project documented. And instead of thinking of test strategies as this all-encompassing document, we are all must follow, which I don't think really works, we basically said, if we were a new tester, what sort of, what would we need to be able to do to actually be able to test on this project? What are the things we need to understand? What are our dependencies? How do we approach automation? And so we actually kind of, I guess validate our test strategy by doing the new tester test, which is when a new tester joins, they follow that document and do what they can and see how they go without too much interaction. Not that we're discouraging communication with team members, but just having that as a starting point and seeing how they progress from there. We're constantly updating this. We're constantly iterating over it. And Shruti, who's in the audience, is a new joiner recently in the Kino project. You know, she's now looking at our Kino web test strategy, which is great. So we try to get those fresh eyes over it as soon as possible as well. So a big part of the way we generate, I guess, QA initiatives is, well, you've just heard me go, wow, we have 36 initiatives. And that sounds really impressive, but how do we actually get those? So for us, we think that the best way to generate those ideas is through the team. So we try to bring in the developers when we can, the testers, and anyone else that's really keen to improve testing processes into a meeting to basically discuss our QA improvements that we wish to achieve over the next month. 
from that, we basically have further meetings with the team leads to get them on board, and we empower the, those initiatives that the team came up with, with enough momentum to basically get that 20% time in sprint. So we actually push it through as real task cards now. And that really dives into the next cut, uh, slide, which shows us how we document our tasks now. So we used to be quite cowboy when uh, we just had the Melbourne team. And we could get away with it, right? Because everyone was around each other. Everyone was sitting right next to each other. We kind of had this close-knit community. But now we're operating across three states. As, as you saw, we've got 18 team members now in our QA practice. So the idea that we can be defining all these amazing initiatives every month and make sure they're all followed up and achieved on, I quickly realised myself that that was not going to happen. So now we have this QA back to practice task wall and it literally links into JIRA, but what it does is it gives it that pretty picture, right? A lot of people from across projects are never going to look in other teams' JIRAs. That's just a fact. You don't want to look at other people's JIRAs because one, you might not understand it, they might not have any context, and let's be honest, JIRA at first glance doesn't always look that pretty. So what we did was we put it into a PowerPoint slide and we send that around the team and it's documenting right now about 118 tasks that we're trying to achieve across projects. It also shows when those initiatives are not getting the steam they need, when we are maybe devoting way too much time to product and not enough time to practice. So that was the other strategic sort of avenue from that. But I can't stress enough that if you're, try, you're out there and you're trying to improve QA practice improvements in your projects, document all your tasks, all the things you're wanting to achieve, and, and, and put it in some medium where you can convey where they're at. Because only then will you get the visibility required to actually push them in the right direction. So now a few uh, tips and tricks on the automation side of things. We've definitely touched on a few of these today, which is great. I mean, we've had some incredible speakers when it comes to automation. But I think I've got a couple of different ones in there. So in the early days, we, uh, needless to say, had quite a bit of a, a few different technology stacks going on there. Um, most of you know it's not very easy to replace a technology stack in an existing system. Um, usually it takes a new system to replace it. Fortunately, and I'll, I'll, I'll attest to it, it was fortunate, a lot of the digital Melbourne side, and indeed even the lottery side, are going through a sort of process where they're upgrading to new technologies and new stacks. So I guess the most important piece of that puzzle for me was making sure I had one close relationship with all the, the, the sort of PMs and the people that were making those decisions on the technology technology stack, but also having the knowledge and, and the, what the team wanted to basically help guide them in a certain direction. So when the decisions were coming up about new web apps potentially going in a whole new technology stack, you were at the table and you could sort of say, hey, no, well, we actually are doing some great things here with React we could leverage of. Oh, and it just so happens that we have some incredible automation stuff happening in that space as well that we could potentially leverage if we chose this as our technology stack. And because of that, this is basically representing 16 systems. So if you do that at most companies, you will see a variety of technologies across the stacks. But as you can see for us, it's incredibly consistent and quite simple. And that's been a massive part of the reason of that transformation you saw. When you see that kind of, oh, you had 16 tests that were basically nowhere to be seen and then to 3,000 automation tests that they're obviously quite proud of, it's because we have this consistent technology across projects now. It's made building new automation a hell of a lot easier. So always have a goal, as best of your ability, to be in on those discussions to produce a consistent technology stack that you can leverage your automation tooling. I can't touch too much on our common automation framework because it's really a chat in itself, but I did want to talk a little bit too about it and, and really just what it's about, I guess, which is a frameworking approach that has generic steps that can work across any same technology web application and or mobile application. Um, the common framework for us is basically an NPM package now that we've developed as a team. It's on the node store. You actually NPM install it into your projects. Hit me up on LinkedIn if you want to link to those two frameworks we have. There's the V1 and the V2 now written in TypeScript. Uh, this, this framework, I couldn't not have a, a slide because it's been a massive part of our success because it's across 12 projects. And because of that, you've got one automation framework across 12 projects instead of 12 pro automation frameworks across 12 projects. So you can imagine the savings right away when you talk about maintainability, coding, um, 
you know, and, and, and this is one of the best bits, and I, I'm really proud to say it in front of this audience, um, you can leverage the best bits. So if you've got some guy on a project that's doing this amazing code or creates a way where maybe you had sleeps all throughout your tests and he worked out a way to make it so it would like not need any sleeps at all, you get that instantly across all 12 of your projects instead of one. Aram, thanks for that retry, mate. <laughs> This was touched on by Ram as well. So at Tabcorp, we have a common element attribute, and it's been an absolute game changer ever since we did it. So across all our web applications where we have the common framework approach, we have the data ID or a test ID. We've, we've, we've basically taken most of them to data ID now due to React. Some of our older Angular apps were test ID, and we're trying to bring them across as well. So. A single attribute that's owned by the testers has been a game changer for a few reasons. One, it's encouraged our testers to get involved more in the code. They no longer feel like they have to wait for the developer to add their ID or their class so they can finally do their automation test. We're encouraging a culture where the testers actually update their data IDs or add them if necessary. That's one of the biggest things. The second one is consistency. So we're, by locking down our framework to work off a data ID, that means that the majority of our tests have to go through a data ID. And because of that, you end up sort of with a culture almost across all 12 projects where everyone understands how to approach automation, what framework to use, and what tests you can automate. The framework now is at a point where people are barely adding any code at all. Because it's been around for over a year, especially the, the, the Common Framework 1 has been around for two years, hadn't had a line of code committed to it now in over a year. Yet we continue to add new tests to the framework. Uh, Davinda's recently added tests in Abacus, Form, AML, using that framework approach and hasn't had to really light, write a single line of code, and that's the beauty of it. You copy and pasting steps because the majority of the framework already exists because it's been developed by someone else that needed to do it before you. And we're applying that now again in the common framework to, again, leveraging a single data attribute for all our elements. We moved away from having our page objects defined in classes or in, in different ways in the common framework as well. So we basically, as a team, felt that putting it in JSON made a lot of sense. So when we say we have data ID consistent across our, our projects, Basically, you're looking at a deposit.json. The best way I can explain this is imagine you've got an automation test. Given I am on the home page, when I click the deposit button, um, just, even just given I'm on the home page, when I click the deposit button, I'm directed to the deposit screen. So that's going to basically say, hey, we're on the deposit screen. We need to look inside the deposit JSON in order to find our page object IDs. And those will match our data attributes in the HTML, our data IDs. Now, that's not going to work in every single application for web in the world because you're going to have some applications that have multiple components. So for single page Angular, React apps in general, this is the perfect approach because you're going to be able to define it on a page basis. Now, if you have something here that's going to be found on like the header, we define that in a common.json, so that's something for all attributes. That way you don't end up with, you know, sign out on every single .json. But uh, generally speaking, we found it to be neat, understandable, and easy for the testers, and that's the key. When non-technical testers have a general understanding of how to add data IDs, define those page objects in JSON for the page that they're trying to automate, and then write tests by copying and pasting steps, then you know you're on the right track. And that's why we've been able to excel so much with our automation testing in such a short period of time. Uh, yeah, this is what I just touched on with the RAM. So there was a time in our early days of the automation framework where we basically had a, a few sleeps. Um, we just couldn't get past a few hairy situations. Uh, this retry probably won't ring any bells for Aram because this was actually one we developed recently based off the one that existed in Common Framework 1. Um, this is a little bit different but works, generally speaking, the same. But what it does is, and I'm sure most people have done automation in this room have hit, is when you're in that situation where, especially in a, in a, like a responsive app for mobile, and you sort of open up like a mobile menu and try and click you know, a button off the mobile menu, Angular and React are not the best with waiting for that animation to complete. So in, in, the, in the past, in the early days especially, we'd have the odd sleep in there, just I sleep for one second or whatever, to basically get us over that hump of the animation not completing, but Angular thinking that Angular was fully loaded so it could click the element. Now, because of retry, 
a great innovation, it'll actually try it. Oh, it didn't work. Try it again and rinse, repeat up to the amount of times that you want to do it. So if you want that pole to hit 10 times, it'll do it. And that alone basically completely removes sleeps across all our projects on the common framework. So it's been really incredible for us. And if anyone else out there is using any JavaScript front-end web client applications and wants a copy of that retry, please reach out. I'll send through that link. It's, it's been massive for us. Negate. So this is a funny little one that a lot of people don't seem to know about, but people really take advantage of it once they hear about it. So it's really just using rejects uh, to basically say should not um, be displayed and then using a negate, which basically returns a true false. All this really does is remove the, the need to have two steps that would be basically the blah element should be displayed and the blah element should not be displayed. So you're basically able to combine those into one step and use negate. So it, it, it's a good way to remove code duplication and we use that widespread now across all our frameworks. Definitely something to look into and can be used across multiple technologies and BDD languages. Automation on a mobile emulator. So this is something we recently uh, moved towards. In our early days, and I think it was actually before Protractor introduced the option, we would actually run our automation on desktop, mobile, and tablet. And I remember we thought we were quite, quite clever when we first did that. But the way we were doing it was a bit cheeky. Between tests, we were actually manipulating the browser resolution. So if it had an at mobile tag, it would go and then at desktop, the next test would pop out, and then the next one would go maybe tablet. And we used that for about a year, and we thought we had it, we had it down back. Like, this was working, we never had to look at it again, it was finding all these bugs, what a genius team. That, that, that was pretty much the mentality, we were, we were getting a bit cocky about it. And um, then we realised there was a much better way to do it, once Protractor introduced device emulation. So to explain the big difference there, Device emulation actually uses the embedded Chrome emulator to run on a real device, and that's a big difference. So just as an example, I'm sure you've all been to a web application where there's a little notification that says, you can download the mobile app to play. Uh, we definitely have it on keno.com.au. Now, if you did it the old way we used to do it, that dialogue would have never shown. So a lot of your tests technically were a bit invalidated because they were doing things that actually the device would. So once we introduced device emulation, even on Kino alone, where we have about 246 or so tests right now in web, yeah, we had a lot of failures. We had a lot of bugs. And it was fantastic, but it was also a bit of like, ooh, this is a bit of an eye-opener. Um, so I can't stress more, if you're using Protractor or any automation framework that allows it, it's worth a Google, uh, look into if you can use device emulation and actually run it on a real device. This was something we, we didn't do in the, the whole first version of the common framework. So in the first version of the common framework, we thought it was really clever. We actually strategically thought it was really clever to have all these sort of paths within our actual framework. At the time, it seemed smart because what we were doing was we were basically saying we want all our folder structures across projects to look exactly the same. We want all our, we want to ensure everyone's using a JSON, a .json to define their page objects. And so we actually put that directly in the framework code and thus as it expanded across 12 projects, we ended up with an automation framework that looked exactly the same in every single project. And that seemed really cool until we met our friends in the lotteries. And, and, and they had their own framework approach, they had their own embedded ways of working, their own folder structures that they were fully bought into. And that's where sort of Common Framework 2 was born. So a new framework built in TypeScript, but with the ability to customise. And this was a big part of the change with Common Framework 2, was we separated out all those sort of static paths or static configurations that we were actually putting in the framework strategically into something that's actually sitting within the project itself. Something you're able to actually define and customise however you want so you can actually have customised folder structures. So you don't have to have your, you know, dot .jsons all in definitions. You can have a mappings folder if that's what you want. You don't also have to have everything defined on a page by page basis. If you're working on a Lotteries app like Lotteries Web, for example, uh, they have 80 components. They have a different component for their header, their footer. It's not like Kino where you have one web application. So we had to define a completely different way to be able to structure your config just so we could actually automate that app. 
We didn't want to lose the common framework approach, so we had to come up with this idea to make it work. And that's why we've got it across lotteries and Keno now, and we'll be replacing common framework one that exists everywhere else across Tabcorp. And what we'll end up with is a common automation framework across lotteries, Keno, and wagering, which is something where we're really hoping to achieve. And uh, it's probably one of the most sort of cross-collaborative initiatives now happening at Tabcorp across business units. Uh, it actually keeps us personally as a QA practice tied together. We actually have a session next week, Devinda, don't we, uh, about uh, V2, basically proof of concept in form. Um, and we're all pretty excited about that. We, we've had a busy last couple of weeks, as you can imagine. Um, so, streamlining CI. So we introduced this quote, I guess you'd say, a, a, way of, a way of working where if the automation is not in, running in CI, it does not count. And that was because in the early days, because the culture towards testing CI as well was so bad, there was this idea that, oh, we have automation now, we're starting to create automation, but we're not actually running in CI. And the reason for that was that they couldn't get the investment or the resources to actually spin up the CI servers and do the necessary configurations to actually get the automation running. When we first walked into Digital Melbourne, the way it was on January 7th, 2017, we had Jenkins, we had Bamboo, we had, we had a bit of everything. We had, we had BuildKite as well. And, and it really was just a call. We were just like, what are we doing? Why are we on four different CI servers? We're paying licensing as well for those servers. Let's consolidate. No one had had that discussion. And, and believe it or not, now, generally speaking, across all our digital web applications, um, outside of a couple in wagering, which were not part of our business unit back there, Almost everything's on BuildKite. And the business has actually just recently committed to pushing all projects towards one single CI server, and that server will be BuildKite. Uh, the beauty of that is, again, as part of our expansion, we were able to leverage all our configuration scripts, all our Docker scripts, um, anything done with our AWS agents, straight away because they already existed. We didn't have to like dig into you know, Team City or Jenkins or d work out all the different ways of doing things. Once you do it once in BuildKite, we could pretty much copy and paste and replicate across projects. So you had people that weren't even DevOps experts. We had testers actually doing and setting up those build pipelines and they do still today. And that's been a massive game changer as well. Just on the right there, or the left, depending on where you're standing, uh, you've got the green mile. That's a bit of fun. So it's a bit of an experimentation area. So we have our Mac minis there, which basically run our mobile automation. Being Tabcorp, we have quite a few restrictions around uh, jurisdiction, as well as some regulatory hurdles. So we do have to run our automation on a device in our own in-house areas. Uh, and you can also see some build monitors there as well. But the Green Mile is pretty cool. It was just like, let's put it all out in the open, have people walking by, see that automation running on a real device. And again, it did, it did become a pretty cool area to hang out. Number 16, so POC everything. Um, we're big fans of proof of concepting everything we do now. So if we have a cool idea as a team, if anyone has a cool idea, we POC it. Because it's one thing to come into a room and be very passionate about a technical solution and push really hard and passionately, but if you don't have proof, it doesn't really fly. So what we're saying now is if you've got a cool idea, a way to do automation, a way to approach CI or, or config scripts, proof of concept with the team. We'll give you the time. And so right now, we're actually doing a proof of concept in Espresso uh, for Android, and we're also doing an XCUI test uh, proof of concept in one of our iOS applications. As you can see in this newsletter article, which I'll detail a bit more soon, you can see Olivia pretty, pretty happy there that he's uh, had the time in our project sprint to basically get our iOS automation running on a real device. For over a year, it was running in a simulator, and it wasn't so much actually setting up the real device that was hard, it was actually setting up the device running on a mock server on a protected Tabcorp network, that was tough. Because we had to point a real device at a locally hosted mock server on a secure network in order to run our automation tests on the pull request. That was why that was a week of work for about one or two of our developers. But we got it there, and uh, Olivia posted that photo the second he did it. <laughs> Mock servers, so 
If you're not sure about mock servers and the difference between a mock server and a stub solution, if you go on my LinkedIn, I recently posted a vlog video about the difference between a mock server and a stub solution, so I'll let you go do that. But generally speaking, our mock servers are a key ingredient, again, to our transformation. So how do they work? So basically, when you think about it here, We've got about seven mock servers now, but we've got those across 13 systems. So most applications I've seen, particularly across the industry, they approach it first with stubbing. And unfortunately, the stubs tend to stick around because they don't get the time to actually invest in a fully fledged mock solution. So I encourage mocking from the start. But because we've got these fully fledged mock servers, which are effectively a real API, but not, they're like a fake, they're like a fake copy of a real API, we can actually run the majority of our automation through these mock servers on pull request, which basically means that we're going to have stable automation. We're going to be able to automate a lot of scenarios we would otherwise be unable to automate. We complement this, um, as Aswin detailed in his talk, through environment testing and scheduled runs. So we'll potentially run you know, all our pull request automation through mock servers, so we can validate all those you know, tricky UI scenarios, but then we'll run a subset of those tests against environments to make sure that we're actually still running correctly against an environment. Because anyone here that's used a mock server knows that a mock server is definitely not the same representative as an environment. Um, What's also quite amazing about this is not only can mock servers be used cross-platform, because if you've got one working for e.g. Kino Web, it's going to work across Kino iOS and Android, assuming they're on the same digital API, is that you can actually use it across different applications. So, you know, our terminal STS stub, which Haram will probably remember fondly, um, an information stub as well, basically returns all our races back to us, all our runners, all our horses, all our... And that's still being used today. That's something Aram and the team championed almost three years ago, and we're still using that across new applications. We're talking about using it in UBET now as part of the restructure. So we have this mock server solution that's continued to grow, to continue to grow, yet hardly even changed. Like, we're keeping it up to date with any changes to our endpoints and our payloads. But really, once we got over the hump of actually getting that bad boy working, it hasn't actually taken that much investment. And now it's across Green Moon Abacus 4, MBT, SSC, AML. Had you not had that mock server, who knows what we would have had there. We probably would have had five different stub solutions completely written differently with a whole bunch of different features and a whole different way of approaching how we approach it. So we're very fortunate to be where we are now with our mocking and, and the whole entire company really in the lotteries and keynote and retail wagering space are completely sold on the approach now, which is fantastic. And you can see a few of the extra benefits there on the side as well. Just a couple of ones to finish. So visibility, uh, we're big on the uh, having the active QA social scene there, as you can see. We try to keep it moving with bug bashes, QA academies, we attend pitch nights, we do a lot of pairing, get to know each other tasks, uh, retros, brown bags, we attend meetups, uh, as many of you know us from. A lot more there, um, team catch-ups, more QA academies, collaboration across state, team meetups. Basically, we're just always hanging out. We're trying to always catch up, hang out, share ideas, be with the team. Um, that's really what it's all about. What I will quickly touch on is the bug bash. I know still a lot of people still come up after conferences and say, man, we don't bug bash. That sounds really cool. Such a simple concept. You know, you're at your end of the sprint. You've developed two or three cool features. Just get one of your testers or developers or a team member to champion it. Get into a room, invite everyone, invite marketing, invite whoever you want, the more the merrier, and basically test those features completely unscripted. So have a bash at the app, because you'll be surprised, you'll find some bugs, and you'll find bugs that the automation won't pick up as well. Our average bug bash tends to find about four or five bugs, and as we add more automation, we're doing more bug bashes, because it finds that stuff the automation doesn't. The monthly QA report, we have put a stop to this as part of the restructure. Um, it was, it was, it's quite a, it's a bulky document because what it did was it basically showed all our key initiatives, e.g. QA Academy, where we meet up and define some new initiatives. Um, we've recently changed that to more of a showcase brown bag, but it's still a really good session. But the controversial piece of this was that we actually documented our automation coverage increasing to the best of our ability based against our manual testing gaps, as well as our unit testing. So we were keeping our developers kind of in check as well with that. And we were also documenting what we were testing for key features across projects. 
as part of the restructure, it was a controversial tool because people saw it as like this big all-encompassing thing and, and with restructures, you just want to stay away from so, that sort of a visibility tool, I think. We are looking to bring it back, probably in a different format um, soon. However, it was incredibly beneficial. So I do want to highlight it. Um, for those not going through a similar situation, it was actually super beneficial because it created a culture of people wanting to increase coverage. It, 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 it also got the developers more on board with thinking about their unit test coverage. Now, I'm not the kind of guy that thinks, you know, 100% unit testing is the way to go. So, you know, there's debate around that as well um, and, and potentially contention as well. Nonetheless, we found it hugely beneficial, so I'll leave it at that. And finally, the QA newsletter. Um, <laughs> I can't speak more highly than introducing a newsletter or some sort of visibility tool where you work. Um, for us, it put us on the map um, and it definitely fueled our uh, growth and our budget, especially in the early days. Because what this newsletter did was basically guaranteed every month that the CIO of Tabcorp and the wider team and all the QAs were seeing the incredible work we were achieving from a quality assurance perspective. Um, it really put us on the map. I mean, even, even as part of the restructure, we were getting shout outs from Mandy for the great work we were doing. And what's beautiful about it is that we share this with other teams. So you can see there on the, the, on the right there, the Control Centre now on Automation Framework V1. That's a wagering initiative, but we're reporting on it in this newsletter. So it's about bringing us together, one team. We're not three business units, we're Tabcorp. And I think that generates a lot of appreciation as well. Um, we generally do bring out about eight or nine articles a month. And so that does put a little bit of pressure on us. We always try and bring it uh, and achieve lots of big, big milestones every single month as well. So that's really cool. People can generally enjoy reading it as well. We get really good feedback and that's why we continue to do it. If you've thought that maybe it was a bit crazy to go, oh, okay, Cam, yeah, I'm just going to go back to my company, write up a newsletter and bomb it out to everyone, that's exactly what I did. So <laughs> it sounds a little crazy, but I literally just CC'd everyone on it, sent it out, and you know what? No one complained. In fact, they were all like, wow, this is really cool. Keep sending it. So I'll leave it with that. Oh, uh, yep, Sakina. So um, when you said... Um Um, yeah. yeah, so when I joined, the teams were very lean to start with. Um, they basically would have about, I would say on average per squad, about three or four devs. But again, they relied so heavily on that, that, that flexi wagering resource structure they had. Um, the biggest challenge I'd say we faced in that situation was that the developers had never really dealt with QA being seen as its own practice, as its own force. And so they were kind of like, who are these people trying to like suddenly change the way we work? You know, we come to work every day, some of them had for 15 years doing it a way they've always done it. So it did take a lot of, a lot of, a lot of discussion. One of the other key drivers which I didn't detail in visibility, and I probably should have, was the showcase. So we actually, and Aram briefly touched on this, we introduced a showcase and we ran it every two weeks and we basically detailed the awesome development work we're doing as well as the automation testing we're doing and that got a lot of people on board. I always remember the first session we had. We sent it out to everyone and we got one person. One person came along to our first showcase and we were so like, you know what, let's rock it anyway. Let's just kill it for this one person to come along. And that one person, fortunately for us, was the head of digital, David Lockery. Um, and he actually said after the showcase, it was the best showcase he'd ever seen. And all we did was really show in the first iteration, the app coming together, as well as automation, running on that app from the start, in CI, passing. And he was blown away, because he just hadn't seen that at Tabcorp, especially on a new project. And suddenly, next board, we had four or five people. And vice versa, over the month, we suddenly had literally up to 30, 40 people. And we had people from other business units coming along and saying, this is one of the favorite parts of their week. And people got so amped up because what they saw was great work, but they also saw passionate people like Aram and myself getting up on the stage and really getting, showing the love for the work we're doing and the amazing things we're achieving. That was a massive driving force as well. Um, so once we kind of got into that mode, testing really hit the scene, and that's when we got the budget and everyone got behind it. And even those developers, 
that have been at the company 15 years realize, you know what, things have to change and we have to change with them. Otherwise, we're going to be going to these showcases for a couple of weeks and we'll be out the door. I think that's really where it got to at some point there. And some of those 15, 20 year developers all a bit are gone now because they didn't like that way of working. I'm sure you'll find some somewhere. Any other questions? Yes, mate. Um, I think on the third slide, you mentioned 80 to 90% coverage. What was that coverage of? Is that features? And if so, how did you define features? So when I say 80-90% coverage, we, we're basing that on the, the conventional test pyramid, so a combination of unit testing, service layer, as well as UI. We're realistic. We don't, we don't think we have the perfect number for that estimate. What we're doing, though, in our test strategy is basically detailing what still needs to be manually tested against what is automated, and then from that we're deriving a statistic from it, and that's the statistic that we're taking to the business. So it's not foolproof by any means, but generally speaking, that's about the best we can get from the project. Any other questions? Yes. So, how do you get uh, management support for uh, the transformation? Yeah, as I say, the management support was something we built up over time. So it was it was the showcases, the newsletter, constantly achieving things, and and literally the team getting behind us too. You know, once we started actually getting automation CI, that really started to win over everyone. You know, business guys, for example, who are the guys you want to win by the way? For anyone listening. If you really want to make a difference at a company and be able to do lots of different things and lots of different improvements and get that budget, get the business people behind you. Show off, show the great things you're doing, really sell them on it because they're the ones that are going to go to their board meetings and, and their, their different meetings when it comes to budget and go, you know what, what they're doing in the QA practice is bloody incredible. We've got to keep that going. We've got to, we've got to take that further. We've got to make sure that's in that new project we're about to spin up. So I'd say, yeah, it's a combination of visibility and passion that has basically given us that enablement. Any other questions? All right, prize time. <laughs> All right, so first we'll do the uh, the bug hunt. Basically, we, we didn't do any good uh, systems around this, I must say. So what we did was we basically took down all the names from the bug hunt and the LinkedIn posts, and we basically put them in Excel and sorted them a bunch of times. We took name number one. So we didn't, we didn't do anything crazy, but it works. So, unfortunately, one of those names is an email address, so <laughs> that's about the best we can do. So, if your email is jitthurgav2007 at gmail. Hey, <laughs> congratulations, you have won the bug hunt, my friend. A very good bug. I'm not going to say which slide it was, but he basically realised a very, a very noticeable spelling mistake in espresso. Well done. Um, okay, the next one. So, the LinkedIn post. By the way, thanks so much for all the LinkedIn posts. They've been going all day. Every time I've uh, sneaked off to the bathroom, I've basically been trying to get them all shared. So I really appreciate it. That's the only time I've had to kind of, hey, share, 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 and take down all the names as well. Um, okay, so the winner of the LinkedIn trending game is Tafleen Ramos. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go out into the foyer. We've basically got a box there that's got some of the postcards. If you've still got it on there, plop it in and let's go do the final prize draw. All right.